Okay, so uh, this is the last uh, lecture for this uh, afternoon session in room one. So uh, this is a lecture uh, again uh, in uh, uh, from section three, number theory, but uh, with a little bit probably of uh, section 12 uh, probability. So the speaker is uh, is uh, Melanie uh, Matchett Wood. Uh, Melanie is professor uh, of mathematics at Harvard University. Uh, before she obtained her PhD in 2009 uh, from Princeton University under the supervision of uh, Manjul Bhargava. And subsequently, she has uh, held a position at Stanford, uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, and in Berkeley. Among the several honors, uh, she uh, is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society and also the recipient of a Packard Fellowship and most recently of the Waterman Award. So, Melanie uh, research interest uh, comprise a broad variety of uh, fields covering algebraic number theory, arithmetic geometry, analytic number theory, and also probabilistic methods. Today, she will speak on probability theory for random groups arising in number theory. Thank you, and thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to speak here. Some of what I'll talk about today includes joint work with Wei Tong Wang, Will Sawin, and Hoi Gwen. All right, so here is my plan. I'm going to first talk about some motivating examples of random groups or distributions on groups that I'm interested in, um, and that I hope you might, might be interested in some of them. And then once you have a sense of what kind of, of distributions on groups or random groups I'm talking about, I'm then going to talk about two topics in the probability theory of these flavors of random groups. Uh, first, we'll talk about the MoMA problem for random groups, and then we'll talk about universality for random groups. So first, what kinds of examples, what do I mean by random groups, what questions am I interested in? And I'll just give a bunch of examples. Okay, so these are distributions of groups that arise in number theory and related and analogous contexts. So one example is as k varies over some collection of number fields, What is the distribution of the class group of k? So for each number field k, the class group of k is some finite abelian group. We know what all the finite abelian groups look like. Um, and in particular, it's one that is of a lot of interest to number theorists because it controls the factorization in the algebraic integers of k. And we could just say, if, if we take a random k or k from some distribution, what distribution of finite abelian groups do we get? You know, how often do we get z mod 3 cross z mod 16? That's one of the finite abelian groups, and you might wonder how often you get that one, et cetera. Um, so I'll make something very precise here, and then you'll have to sort of imagine the precise versions of many of the other questions. But here's you know, one way you could vary such a k. You could take a uniform random square free integer uh, in an interval from 2 to x for some large x. And then the number field, the field that I'm talking about, could be q adjoined the square root of d. So that's a real quadratic field. Um, and this is especially an interesting question to study not for just one x, but asymptotically as x goes to infinity. When you do that, then you're somehow understanding the behavior of all of the real quadratic fields and you know, not just the first million. Uh, and like many questions in prob um, probability, th there are really interesting behaviors in the asymptotic uh, distributions. So actually, all of these questions implicitly, there are some sort of asymptotic distributions. But I won't really talk about the asymptotic aspect so much today. Um, and also for prime p, You know, maybe we're not so ambitious and we don't want to understand the whole class group, but maybe we could just ask about the p-torsion in the class group. So that is some finite abelian group. It's an fp vector space. Or maybe the silo p subgroup um, of, of the, the class group. We could ask you know, other questions about smaller pieces of the class group. And in all of these examples, you could do similar things where there's some distribution on groups of interest, but maybe you can take some piece of the group as well. So here's another example. We could let 
E, vary over some collection of elliptic curves, say over the rationals or over your some other number field. Um, and what could a collection of elliptic curves look like? It could just be all of them up to isomorphism, or maybe it's a quadratic twist family. Those are natural families of elliptic curves. And then we could ask, what is the distribution of the p Selmer group of E? So p is a prime, just like in the past example. And what is the p Selmer group? It is some finite abelian group in particular. It's an fp vector space, uh, so not even that scary of a group. And it controls the rank or the rational solutions to the elliptic curve. So the elliptic curve looks like this. It has, uh, say, an A and B that are rational numbers. And then the elliptic curve is the set of points that are on, that satisfy this equation. So values of x and y that satisfy this. And for each A and B, which give you an elliptic curve, there is some group, uh, some algebraic structure attached to that elliptic curve, which in this case is FP vector space, which controls how many rational solutions there are, there are to the curve. So um, this is another example where you, you have some family of objects of interest, uh, especially to number theorists. And for each of those objects, you get some group. And you might wonder, well, how often do you get you know, uh, a one-dimensional, two-dimensional, et cetera, vector space over, over FP in this case? So here's an example of quite a different flavor, uh, it, more of a linear algebraic flavor. If M is a random N by N matrix, and say each entry is independent, uniform from 0, 1. So I just flip a coin N squared times to pick the coefficients of my matrix, are either 0 or 1. Because those coefficients are integers, they give me a linear transformation from Z to the N to Z to the N, so on integral vectors. And then I could ask, here, how do I build a group out of that, I could ask about the quotient group z to the n mod the image of the linear transformation. That's the column space of the matrix. And so this is sort of asking in a group theoretic way, how close is the column space of this matrix integrally uh, to the, the z to the n that it's mapping into? So that is a abelian group. It's usually a finite abelian group. Um, and you could say, well, how often is it, w which group, what's the distribution? At first, this might look like quite a different sort of example, but actually there's a kind of underpinning analogy here. Um, and so this is very related to the question, what is the distribution of the Jacobian of an erdos rinne random graph? So the Jacobian of a graph, it's also known as the Sampile group, it is a group that is formed in the same way by taking z to the n mod uh, the column space of a matrix. But here, the matrix is the graph Laplacian. But the graph Laplacian kind of looks like one of these 0, 1 matrices, mostly. OK, it's, it's symmetric, and the diagonal is a little different. But in spirit, it's a similar flavor question. And uh, as the, 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 the term Jacobian here uh, might suggest, there is some kind of analogy to the, to the first question. Um, uh, in, in some analogy between, between graphs and, and number fields. All right, so there's some examples. I have more examples. I love examples. Um, so speaking of analogies, uh, if instead I vary C over some curves over a finite field, I could ask about the distribution of their Picard group. So this is a group of line bundles on the curve. And this is also an analogy to, to the very first question. This is what we would call the function field analog of the class group question. Um, and I could actually, when I'm thinking about a curve, I might think of other groups attached to it. I could ask about the distribution of its fundamental group. So now this is a group that won't necessarily be an abelian group. This is the first non-abelian group we've seen. And so I have to take the algebraic or a tall fundamental group to make sense of this, since it's a curve over FQ and not over the complex numbers. But there is such a notion, and I get a, a group that might be, be non-abelian. And so now all of a sudden, I've transition from asking something that feels very concrete, because we know all the finite abelian groups, uh, to something maybe a little scarier, because we don't maybe know as intimately all the possible things that, that pi 1 of a curve over a finite field could be. Um, now, reversing the analogy back to the number field case, the analogous question here to ask is if k varies over some number fields, finite extensions of q, 
if we take the maximal and ramified extension of K, so this is the covering space, of what's the distribution of the Galois group of this covering space over K, which is actually literally the algebraic pi 1 of the geometric space that we associate to K, spec of the ring of integers. So this is just completely analogous to uh, the previous question. So, okay, maybe I, all these examples are secretly the same example um, in, in some way, but I hope that by phrasing them in different ways, some of them will appeal to you. Um, and speaking of that, I'll give another analogous example um, in another analogy between number fields and function fields over uh, finite fields and three manifolds, we could consider the question as M, say, varies over three manifolds in some family. For example, Dunfield and Thurston gave a model of a random Haggard splitting, which could give you a random three manifold that sees all of the, the, the compact without boundary three manifolds. And so as you take a random three manifold in that sense, you could ask, what's the distribution of its fundamental group? Uh, so um, this is a, you know, usually, uh, non-abelian, non uh, certainly can be infinite group, and we could ask as we vary over three manifolds in some precise way, but you know, uh, what, what distributions of fundamental groups do we have? All right, so I hope in all of these examples, maybe at least one of them appeals to you as a kind of group that you might be interested in knowing the distribution of. And in all of these examples, there has been work where the probability theory of random groups has helped prove a theorem about these distributions. Now, of course, to understand these distributions, you have to understand some number theory or some topology or whatever uh, the flavor, algebraic geometry over FQ, whatever the flavor of the question is. Uh, you can't, can't get away without that. But um, in all of these cases, there's been some substantial contribution from ideas that are really outside of the, the, the specific domain and really land more in probability theory of random groups. And that's the aspect that I'm going to talk about today, that probability theory of random groups that can be applied in all of these examples to help, um, you know, in addition to whatever you know about the number theory or the topology, to tell you something about these distributions. Okay. so. Now let me talk about the first aspect of that probability theory that I want to get to today, which is the moment problem for random groups. So I'm going to start just reminding us all of the classical moment problem, uh, which is the problem of recognizing distributions of real numbers or random numbers from their moments. So when we have some distribution of, of numbers, or you could say a random variable valued in the reals, we can often recognize what distribution we have from its moment. So what are the moments? They're indexed by natural numbers k. And the kth moment is the average of x to the k over whatever distribution you're talking about. So maybe if you write your distribution as a measure mu, um, you, you'd write it, this is the integral of x to the k d mu. Or maybe if you're thinking in terms of a random variable, you would write uh, essentially the same thing, the expectation of x to the k, where capital X is the random variable. And so this, these, these are numbers for each k. They're averages over your distribution of interest. Uh, and so here are two extremely important distributions, probably the most important distribution on the reals, the Gaussian distribution. And I've given here explicitly approximately its moments. So these are the centered moments so that the formula is short enough to fit on the slide. Uh, so it's some slight shift of the, the moments. Uh, so once you center your Gaussian, of course, it's symmetric. So the odd moments are going to be 0. And then the even moments are sigma to the k, k minus 1 double factorial. That's like the factorial, but you go down two numbers at a time instead of 1 when you're multiplying. Um, and uh, the Poisson distribution, an extremely important distribution on the natural numbers. Uh, it has very simple moments if you translate them in the right way. It's just the kth power of the Poisson parameter. And OK, so these are some averages of these, these functions um, over these distributions. And you know, please don't worry about the shifting, uh, that they're not exactly x to the k. The point is that knowledge of the average 
value of these distributions and these sort of shifted moments up to k is equivalent to knowledge of the first k moments you can sort of see as an exercise of, of a distribution. And what we're really interested in is whether knowledge of the moments is enough to know the distribution. If you've never seen anything like this before, it's natural to think, how could it be? It's just a sequence of numbers. Like distributions have all these bumps. Like There's so much more information than a sequence of numbers. But it turns out um, that, at least in nice cases, uh, they aren't that much more information than the, uh, this sequence of numbers. So I'll just say very informally, the uniqueness in the classical moment problem says when moments don't grow too fast, then there's at most one distribution with those moments. So if you have some unknown distribution and you see that it has the same moments as, as, the, um, as the Gaussian distribution, then you can identify, oh, I've got a Gaussian distribution or similarly for the Poisson distribution. OK, and what is too fast? I'll just tell you that actually you can grow exponentially in k. That's OK. If your kth moment is like e to the k, that's not too fast. But if you grow like e to the k squared, that's too fast. It's not just too fast for the theorem, uh, the, the proof of the theorem. It's too fast for the truth at the order of, of e to the k squared. There are multiple distributions that can have the same moments. All right, so that was a race through the notion um, of the moment problem of recognizing a distribution of real numbers from certain averages across that distribution. And it turns out this is incredibly useful because moments are often much more accessible than somehow direct hands-on information about the distribution. Essentially, maybe because of linearity of expectation, uh, there are a lot of, lots of contexts, both empirically and theoretically, where we can access moments more easily than directly accessing the distribution. But of course, if you can combine this with a theorem like that, then you can, in fact, find, find your distribution. All right, so now I want to talk about moments of random groups. So I'm going to mention a couple of examples that I think of as being really important um, starting work in this direction of moments of random groups. So a paper of Heath Brown from 94, where he was studying the distribution of two summer groups of certain elliptic curves, these particular elliptic curves, y squared minus x y squared equals x cubed minus dx, where d is ranging over some square free integers. So this is a quadratic twist family. Um, and for each of these elliptic curves, he gets this, this two sum group that tells him something you know, about the rank, about this, the rational solutions to this equation. Another example is a paper of Fouvry and Kluners from 2006, in which they see a certain slice of the class groups of quadratic fields. So twice the class group mod four times the class group. So why, why this piece? Uh, because twice uh, the two torsion in the class group is actually already understood from something called genus theory. And so this is like the next piece of the two CELO subgroup of this finite abelian group. So if you were kind of trying to understand it one piece at a time, you can be like, OK, well, I understand the two torsion. Now what if I, you know, can I understand the, the next uh, slice of the group? Um, for these finite abelian groups that control the factorization in these, these number fields, these quadratic number fields in this case. So uh, in both cases, these authors were trying to study distributions on what in the end are F2 vector spaces. So they are, they are groups, um, these random F2 vector spaces, if you uh, think of starting with a random one of these elliptic curves or number fields. And if you just have an F2 vector space, and you know, I should say it's a finite dimensional F2 vector space, you don't really have to think about having the data of a group. right? You could just treat the vector space by its size, because of course the size of an F2 vector space uniquely determines its isomorphism class. And so at this point, you just sort of feel like, well, I just have a random number, not a random group. So let me just, can I, can I find the moments? And in both cases, they could. They found the moments. And the moments are, for example, around the size of, say, 2 to the k squared over 4, which is precisely too large to apply the classical moment problem theory for random real numbers. In fact, you know, there are distributions on the reals that have moments of this size um, and have the same moments but are different distributions. So they had to say, well, OK, I guess I have more than just a number. I know it's a power of two. 
Like that's, that's certainly more information than just knowing I have a real number. Uh, maybe I can use that and prove a more refined MoMA problem. And in both cases, that is, is what, they, what they did. So in both cases, there was some candidate distribution of F2 vector spaces where the distribution and the moments were all known explicitly. You know, they knew the probability. You get a three-dimensional one, four-dimensional one, five-dimensional one, just some explicit distribution, not coming from elliptic curves or class groups where you just describe the probabilities explicitly and you can compute the moments and everything um, is elementary. And then the authors used number theory to prove that the moments of these random groups coming from elliptic curves or coming from number fields matched the moments of this well understood candidate distribution. And then they proved a new theorem that in this case, even though if you just treat the size of the group as a number, the moments are too large, if you, you know, add in the information that it's a power of two, uh, you can show that the moments indeed determine a unique distribution. And through this approach, they found in both of these cases, the distributions of these, these groups that are of a lot of interest. All right, so that um, is good for, for F2 vector spaces. But as you saw in the example, well, we want to think, I mean, even if you just want to go to finite abelian groups or finite abelian P groups, groups are no longer determined by their size. And then maybe we even want to understand infinite groups and you know, not abelian groups. So we're not going to be able to just treat groups as numbers. And so now I'm going to fast forward a bit to um, what I would say is the modern theory of moments of random finite groups or possibly profinite groups. And these moments, let me tell you about them. So instead of being indexed by natural numbers k, they are indexed by finite groups. So for a group, you have group G, you're going to have a Gth moment. But the moments themselves are still numbers. So you still get a sequence of numbers. And the Gth moment, um, say, of a random variable x, is the average of the number of surjective group homomorphisms from x to G. So x is the random group. And this number of surjective homomorphisms or quotient maps to G, you know, it's telling you about the group structure of, of x, or if you prefer to write it in terms of a distribution, you could say the gth moment of some distribution mu is the average of the number of surjective um, homomorphisms uh, to your fixed group g over mu. So, and it, you can maybe now see why I say this is about, say, finite groups, because it makes a lot of sense if you have a finite uh, group to ask about the number of surjective homomorphisms to another finite group. And it turns out that you can also understand random profinite groups this way. And well, what are profinite groups? They're, they're essentially groups that we understand ex explicitly by understanding all of their finite quotients. Uh, so from that point of view, it's, it's not uh, perhaps so surprising that th this kind of information, asking about all the finite quotients of a random profinite group, you know, might tell you about profinite groups. But at least with this definition, you can't hope to see more than uh, than profinite groups. In particular, there are groups that don't have quotients, non-trivial groups that don't have quotients to any finite group. You're not going to see these through some kind of average like this. So this sees groups that have finite quotients and can be understood via, via their finite quotients. All right. Um, and so let me give you an example. Now here I'll give a precise theorem on the uniqueness of the moment problem for finite abelian groups. All right, so this is joint with my graduate student, Wei Tong Wei. And so we show, for example, if x and y are random finite abelian groups, or you can think of distributions on abelian groups, if for each finite abelian group A, um, the expected number of surjections from x into A, so this is the eighth moment uh, of x, is equal to the expected number of surjections of y into A, the eighth moment of y. So if the moments match, and then we need some condition that the moments don't grow too fast. And this uh, big O is that condition they don't grow too fast. And how fast can they grow? It needs to be something in terms of A. And we say they can't, shouldn't grow faster than the size of the second wedge 
power of A. So this is something you can make completely explicit for any finite abelian group. Um, but this is maybe a nice abbreviated way to, to express it here algebraically. So if you have two distributions and these averages for every group A match, every finite abelian group match for them, and they don't grow too fast, then X and Y have the same distribution. So it's like it's the same kind of thing as the moment problem for numbers, that these functions, their averages, you know, do a good job distinguishing distributions of finite abelian groups. And this, uh, I stated this here because it's kind of the most compact, easy to state uh, result like this. Uh, but this kind of result has been applied, for example, uh, by Ellenberg, Vegetesh, and Westerland in uh, 2016, and by uh, Lou, uh, myself, and Zurich Brown in 2019 to say something about the distribution of Picard groups of curves over, over FQ, um, which is also known as the function field uh, cohen linster martinet so the distribution of the class groups as function fields, in some uh, regime where Q is going to infinity. And so these are some specific finite, you know, some specific abelian groups that are arising uh, in number theory, you could say in algebraic geometry over FQ, um, for which one uses, uses algebraic geometry over FQ to compute the moments, and then a theorem like this uh, uniqueness of the moment problem to say, oh, now I actually know the distribution. And in this case, uh, this cohen linster martinet refers to the fact that there were specific conjectures for what the distribution should be. So there was a candidate distribution who, you know, we could describe explicitly how often do you get each group and what the moments are. And so once you match those moments, uh, you can you get, a, get a result. And I should just say, uh, to be historically accurate, um, Allenberg, Vegetesh, and Westerland pl uh, applied their own version that just was about p low subgroups and worked for certain moments. And um, uh, in uh, the paper with Lou and Zerg Brown, we actually had to apply an analog of this that's more general that is for finite abelian R modules for certain rings R. That's also in the paper with, with Wei Tong Wang. But in spirit, this is the kind of result uh, that one, one uh, that has been applied in in many contexts uh, now to say something, for example, about the distributions of class groups or Picard groups of curves over finite fields as Q goes to infinity. Um, all right, now I said, um, maybe I should just say, in these cases, there were candidate uh, distributions and we used algebraic geometry over FQ to uh, find the moments and then use probability theory to say, okay, that uh, tells us that they match the, these candidate conjectural distributions. But what happened is we got very good at the algebraic geometry over FQ and we started finding more moments of distributions, but they were moments that we didn't recognize. They, you know, they were, were mom you know, moments we had never seen a distribution with those moments. So the uniqueness of the moment problem uh, doesn't help you find the distribution if you don't know a distribution with those moments. So what if, what if that happens? What if you're so good at finding moments that you um, don't know an explicit distribution with the moments you find? I mean, the uniqueness theorem, it might tell you that there, yes, there exists a distribution with those moments. But you know, if it did, there's at most one. But you want to know, like, what actual distribution do you have? And so um, in recent work with Will Solomon, we give an approach to construct a distribution of random groups explicitly from the moments. So if you give us a list of these averages of number of surjections onto G for every finite group G, we will describe to you explicitly with formulas uh, what distribution of finite or profinite groups uh, those, those moments have to be coming from. Um, and the first application of this approach is in a paper of ours that's on the archive uh, now, in which we find the distribution of the profinite completions of fundamental groups of random three manifolds with explicit formulas. Like if you take, and I mentioned there's this notion, a certain notion of a random three manifold, and if you take that notion, then you can describe explicitly the, with, with formulas the, the distribution on the profinite completions of the fundamental groups. And these fundamental groups are residually finite with probability one, so they, they inject into their um, 
profinite completions, and so you know, you're really getting a lot of information. In particular, getting all the information sort of about finite quotients of, of these three manifold groups. So I'm going to give you uh, an example of the kind of thing these formulas can tell you. I mean, we're now in the land of all groups, so it's, it's kind of complicated for one slide to sort of write down all the formulas. So I'm just going to give you the simplest corollary that sort of fits on a, on a slide. So I need a definition. Let an S group be a group whose order is a product of powers of primes at S. So S is a set of primes. So it's like a P group, except you can allow a few Ps. Like instead of a seven group, you have like a two, three, five, seven group or something. Okay? And then this is the kind of, uh, this is an example of what we can say about these fundamental groups of random three manifold. So let S be a finite set of primes. So for a random three manifold from Dunfield Thurston's model of random Haggard splittings, so this I'll just describe very briefly. You take two uh, genus G solid handle bodies and you pick a random element of the mapping class group of genus G to glue them together to make a compact three manifold without boundary and you let uh, the genus in this model go to infinity and since every uh, uh, compact without boundary three manifold has a Haggard splitting. You see all the three manifolds in this way. Um, and then for each of those three manifolds, they have a fundamental group. And we show, for example, that the probability that the fundamental group of your random three manifold has no non trivial S group quotients. Okay, so that's something, you know, S is any finite set of primes, and then I'm asking, you know, what are the chances that, that there are no S group quotients? Is this number? So this thing at the bottom is a number written explicitly. It's a product over the primes in S times some product of some function of P, you know, one, the product over J of 1 plus P to the minus J inverse. So those are some numbers between 0 and 1 that are getting multiplied. That sort of feels like what probability should do. And then actually, uh, this really is a product over the... Um, uh, finite simple S groups where this product over primes in S was just a product over the abelian finite simple S groups. And we also have a factor for the non-abelian finite simple S groups. And for such a thing, you also get this, this positive number between 0 and 1, e to the um, minus the size of the Schur multiplier or the second group homology over the size of the outer automorphism group. So I just want to emphasize, you know, this is, uh, this is some number between 0 and 1. So it's different than the spirit of a lot of things where you prove that asymptotically something happens 100% of the time or 0% of the time. This is some particular uh, value between, between 0 and 1 that obviously as you add more primes to S, it's harder to have no non-trivial S group quotients. And so you can see this is going get, to get smaller as you throw more primes into S. You have uh, less probability. But there's always some precise um, precise number there. Okay. So um, we got this result, I'll say, just similar to the arc of the story of the first examples I, I gave by doing some topology to prove the moments. Uh, it turns out, actually, in this context, uh, the moments grow a little too large for there to be a unique distribution if you don't know anything more about the fundamental groups than just that there are, say, some finitely generated groups. But we use algebraic topology to prove some new th theorems on the group theoretic properties of three manifold groups, uh, some parity properties, and then that is enough with that additional to topological information that you know, we not only prove uniqueness of the moment problem, but we prove we can, from those moments, turn them into formulas for the distribution of, the, um, of these pi ones or their profinite completions, and that can give, give formulas like this. So now we've seen sort of the range of, of examples all the way from, um, from F2 vector spaces, which just barely feel like groups, to these really like very interesting, you know, often infinite non-abelian groups um, where this moment problem theory can be, can be applied in addition to knowledge from the sort of the field of study itself uh, to say something about a distribution of groups. All right, so now, so actually in all six of the examples I started with, 
Uh, there have been applications of the moment problem theory. Now I'm going to go to another sort of topic, which is the universality for random groups. And so this, in contrast, I think is more in its infancy, and I hope to see uh, more applications uh, of this. And so I'll end this with a lot of open problems, I hope, to encourage uh, development of, of this part of the probability theory for random groups. All right, so first, like I did in the moment problem case, okay, what, let me just remind us all of what is classical universality, and I'll start with you know, the canonical example in probability theory, the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem tells us that if we have a bunch of, say, independently identically distributed random real numbers, um, that as n goes to infinity, if we average uh, n of those random variables appropriately normalized, we get a normal distribution. All right, and so the aspect of this central limit theorem that I want to emphasize and what um, one means by universality is that the output distribution uh, of this process, so the output distribution is always a Gaussian distribution. I mean, there's this one, one parameter here from the variance, but this output distribution combines the xi and it's largely insensitive to the input distribution. So sometimes people say garbage in, garbage out, but the central limit theorem is totally different. Garbage in, Gaussian distribution out. It's great. It, you could have put any kind of junk you want, and this averaging process and the independence and the magic of probability, um, it, it not only smooths out what you get, but it tells you it has to be some particular thing. And that's the universal nature in universality. And of course, this is just the tip of the iceberg of an incredibly ubiquitous phenomena in probability theory, where one has um, you know, some kind of process where you feed in distributions, combine them with independence, and output some distribution that you can know asymptotically what it is, even if you know almost nothing about what you put in to, to the machine. Okay, uh, so that, that's the kind of example to have in mind. That's what I mean by universality in probability theory. And now I want to give an example of universality theory for random finite abelian groups. Uh, so this it, specific theorem is joint with Hoi Gwynn, and it says the following. So we take n and u to be integers and some positive epsilon, and we consider a matrix, uh, n by n plus u matrix, whose entries are going to be integers, say iid, identically distributed independent copies of some random integer, and I really emphasize this, from any distribution. So you could imagine, for example, that distribution we talked about before where you take zero with probability a half and you take one with probability a half, or maybe imagine a crazier distribution where you take you know, three, you know, 0.2 of the time and you take 87.3 of the time and you take negative 17 with some probability, but you know, that's it. Those are your three favorite numbers. So, you know, so, um, so this is going to be that insensitivity to the input distribution. But, okay, we have to have some, uh, something to make sure that these input distributions aren't totally degenerate. So for every prime p, we require that if you ask, well, what's the probability that you're congruent to some particular residue mod p? It shouldn't be 1, because that's not a very random thing. You can't just take some x that is always even, for example, or always 1 mod 3. So we use this epsilon to bound away from 1 how often you can see some residue mod p. Now, no, we're not asking that you see all the residues mod p. You could, two of them will be sufficient. You just can't be really completely concentrated in one place. All right, so this is this non-degeneracy condition. And then um, we're going to use this matrix to build a, um, a random finite abelian group, similar to how we've seen before. And the result is that for any fixed finite abelian group A, and so U uh, is, this, is a parameter, you should think of it like the uh, standard deviation in the Gaussian. So this is going to be a parameter um, in, our, in our family of universal distributions. So for any finite fixed abelian group, asymptotically, so as n goes to infinity, the probability that a certain random group, and we'll come parse this a second later, but we use the matrix to build a random group, and we're saying exactly what the asymptotic distribution of this random group is. So for every finite abelian group A, the probability that some random group we build is isomorphic to A 
is equal to this precise number here that does not say anything about the distribution uh, that we input into this machine, that distribution of the little x. It's a number. It's 1 over the youth power of the size of A times the size of the automorphism group of A times some product of uh, inverse zeta values. So zeta s here is the Riemann zeta function. OK, so let's like zoom back in on the random abelian group. What group is this? So it's an abelian group. We start with z to the n, the free abelian group on n generators. And then we take the quotient by the image of z to the n plus u under this matrix, this linear transformation. So again, that's just the column space of the matrix. So we used a random matrix, and we, um, we took the quotient of z to the n by the column space of this matrix. So stepping back and thinking about it abstractly, this um, random group is the quotient of a fixed free abelian group, z to the n, um, mo modulo the quotient by random relations. So the re each relation is given by the columns of m. And so these relations are not taken uniformly on the group. They're just taken in some way such that the coordinates are are independent from some distribution that might be ugly, might be crazy, who knows what it is. Uh, and no matter what um, distribution you start with, you get this precise universal distribution um, from this process. And so even, I should say that this, these distributions are exactly the distributions that arise in the number theoretic conjectures about distributions of class groups of number fields. So in that way, it sort of shines a new light on those conjectures. It's one thing to have a conjecture that a distribution is equal to some specific thing that you write down. And then it's another thing when, you, when that specific thing is, say, a Gaussian distribution. Um, uh, I mean, in some ways, you know, I mean, maybe it makes it, it, it more believable, but it changes the character of the kind of result, I, I think. And so these these universal distributions are actually you know, predicted to arise in these number theoretic contexts. And they've been predicted to arise like, from far before we knew that they had this kind of universality property. All right, so um, that is on the sort of finite abelian group side, where we have uh, some, some nice universality uh, results. Um, we zoom out, what did we have? We had a quotient of a fixed free abelian group by random relations. And as n went to infinity, the resulting distribution was largely insensitive to the distribution of the relations. And so this has been applied, well, not this precise result, but analogs for symmetric matrices, which are actually much harder because there's a now dependency. Um, because you, know, you have a symmetric matrix, now you have some dependencies between entries that are even in different columns. So it's a little more complicated. Um, but one can show analogs for symmetric matrices, and they have been applied, for example, uh, to find the distribution of Jacobians or Sampile groups of random erdos rinne random graphs. Uh, and uh, Mazars in 2020 uh, applied these kind of ideas for uniform uh, random deregular graphs, which had a, a remarkable and beautiful application, which it proved the non-singularity of adjacency matrix matrices of uniform deregular graphs, which was a big Open problem, and on the face of it, is a problem that feels like it's entirely over the reals and doesn't have anything to do with groups. But he, um, he used the, the distribution of the, the Jacobians to answer this non-singularity question. So those are some examples in the domain of these random finite abelian groups of, of universality. And now I'm very interested in thinking about universality for further random algebraic structures. And we have, there are little hints of this. So for example, in my work with Salman on three manifolds, we do allow some flexibility in how you build the random three manifold. Essentially, you can take any choice of generators for the mapping class group. But that's, a, that's much less than, than the theorem that I, I just told you in terms of how universal things are being. But the, even the fact that that is true in this you know, most kind of infinite non-abelian context gives us a lot of hope that quite generally one might expect universality results for random algebraic structures. And so in my notes, I give a lot of very precise uh, open problems. And I just want to highlight like what some of, some of them are. 
I wonder, can we prove universality for, say, random finite abelian groups with additional structure? Maybe the additional structure would be something like an alternating pairing. And you might wonder about this if you care about, for example, the distribution of tate shafarevich groups of elliptic curves, um, because they come with this, this additional structure. Um, and so many times these, these groups that are rising in distributions have some additional structure, and then maybe you want to understand that as well. Um, random finite or profinite groups where we just drop the abelian um, uh, criterion, so more, more generally, um, just universality for random groups, say from, from uh, the free group on G generators mod uh, some random relations. Um, one can ask about random rings, modules, as you get into this, these algebraic structures that come up, you know, have more and more algebraic structures, so we want to understand this in all those contexts. And indeed, for applications, um, one usually would want something maybe even a little stronger, which is to weaken the hypotheses, to allow you know, for some dependence on the inputs, as long as it's maybe not too much dependence, it's a sort of bounded asymptotically, um, and to maybe allow some degeneracy of the inputs, as long as you know, they're, they're not all too degenerate. So the, somehow, the, the weaker your hypotheses are in your universality, the bigger of class of things you're allowed to input. Of course, the stronger the result will be, and the more potential applications. Um, so in summary, I think that this is a very exciting direction, and I'm looking forward to seeing the future applications of, of these kinds of universality ideas to help us understand random algebraic structures. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Melanie, for this great lecture. So you are uh, for follow-up question. Uh, you can join on, on Discord, and Melanie will be uh, very happy to answer uh, your questions. Uh, she's already answering, I see. And um, so I wanted to close uh, this uh, afternoon session by thanking all the speakers for their uh, great lectures. And finally, I would like uh, to advertise in less than 30 minutes the plenary talk by uh, Kanan Sandararajan on uh, distribution of L function. Thank you very much. <laughs>